You're listening to TGI Sports Talk with your host, Keith Angle, on Northeast Streaming Sports. Good morning, everybody. Keith Angle for TGI Sports Talk right here on the Northeast Streaming Sports Network. How are you today? It's a beautiful Friday morning here in East Greenbush. We are... The first and hopefully only streaming uh, sports webcast here on Facebook, on YouTube, on any podcast outlet you can think of, iHeartRadio, Spotify, etc. Good morning, Dave Gayette. Good to see you this morning. Thanks for popping in. Listen, I want to thank my guest from last week, um, Dan Epstein, uh, author of the new book out, uh, the Captain to Me, he wrote with Ron Bloomberg. Great read, guys. Go to Amazon, get it. Uh, you'll see a link on the TGI Sports Talk page. Uh, we, he's also written some other great books as well from about 70s baseballs we talked about. If you are into 70s baseball as I am, please, please take a look at this uh, interview from Dean Epstein last week. My guest today, and again, I want to thank all the groups that allow me to share this too. Uh, they'll be, uh, I'll be sharing it to all the Cubs and Phillies and White Sox groups and all the Major League Baseball groups and some others, uh, because my guest today is Warren Brewster, former relief pitcher for the Phillies, part of the world champion 1980 Philadelphia Phillies. Uh, Also pitched with the White Sox uh, for a short time and Tony La Russa and uh, finished up his career with the Cubs. Uh, He went on to do some coaching uh, in the Phillies organization and has for the past 20 years has been the pitching coach for the Napa Valley a community college out there in California, and we'll talk a little bit about that. His wife, Jennifer, also is uh, the president and CEO of the Tug McGraw Foundation. Uh, Tug McGraw, if you don't know, is a tremendous, tremendous relief pitcher, pitcher and quite a character uh, for the for the Mets and the Phillies in the 60s and 70s and even the 80s, and uh, died tragically at a very young age of brain cancer. And They established uh, his son, uh, Tim, as you may know, a country singer, a uh, very famous country singer and his wife, Faith Hill, and Jennifer and Warren Brewster established this foundation in his name. So we'll talk a little bit about that as well. I in, I did this interview last night with Warren because he does live in California. We had some technical difficulties at the beginning, so I'll play the, I'll play the, uh, the video to start, and then I'm going to fast forward a little bit till we had to go to the phone because uh, his phone connection was not working out well for the video. So Without further ado, I will say good morning to Brett Cloutier, but without further ado, I'm going to start the interview, and we'll see you guys in a little bit. As
specifically a day, a Sunday day game in mm-hmm. Montreal, where I came into the game with the bases loaded and I faced Tony Perez. Now, here's a person that I've idolized since I was a little kid. And I throw him a sinker. He hits ground ball to Schmitty at third. Schmitty steps on third, throws it across the diamond, and I get out of the inning with a double play. And I go, I, I belong. I, I know I can play here now. So, you know, it takes, it's, it's a transition. And the biggest thing was they didn't, they didn't tell me to do anything different than I'd done in the minor league. They gave me the ball and said, here, run with it. And, and I did. And, uh, I was very fortunate to play on AstroTurf early in my career. I would jam a lot of people with the, the velocity I had. And fortunately, playing on AstroTurf, uh, the ball would get to the infielders and they could turn double plays. And then to have Mike Schmidt at third, Larry Bowe at short, uh, Ted Sizemore, Manny Trio, Richie Hebner, Pete Rose at first in, in those years was, uh, very good. It, it made my job very easy because I was a ground ball pitcher. I, I believe, um, my rookie year, we had nine pitchers on the staff and I think I had 23% of the ground ball double plays that, that other, that the other team hit into. So I was very high percentage on getting ground balls and getting double plays. So that was kind of my niche. I came in in the middle of the inning with runners on base anywhere from the first inning to the seventh inning. And then they would let, in the eighth and ninth inning, we had Gene Garber, Tug McGraw, and Ron Reed. They would pitch the last two innings because they were veteran pitchers. But uh, finally, by the end of 1978, Danny Ozark called me in the office where we played the Dodgers in the playoffs and he said, You're gonna be the first guy in the in the out of the bullpen every night, whether it's the first inning or the ninth inning. It didn't matter what the situation was, you're the first guy coming out because you're getting ground balls consistently and you're getting people out consistently. So um I pitched in three of the four games in that series and the only game I didn't pitch in was uh lefty pitched a complete game and I was up five times in that game. He was he struggled to he gave up a grand slam, I believe, to Ron Say, like the fourth or fifth inning to tie it at five to five. And then we came back right after that, scored a couple runs, and he was able to hang on, and he ended up pitching, pitching all nine innings. Well, like I said, those were some great teams, but you ran into some really good Dodger teams in 77 and 78. Um, right. How tough was that to, to have those types of years and then, you know, have it end in – well, the, the most difficult one was 1977 when we we won the first game in Dodger Stadium. They won the second game. We went to Philly, and they still to this day call it Black Friday. Uh, we had a five to three lead with two outs and nobody on in the top of the ninth inning, and uh, Vic Gavilio came up on it, got on first. Manny Mota hit a ball that Greg Lozinski pinned against the left field fence for a double. Uh, next ball that was hit was a ground ball that hit the seam of the Astro turf at third base, deflected off Mike Schmidt. Larry Boa came out of nowhere and all in one motion threw the ball to first base. Reggie, Richie Hebner caught it at first base. Davey Lopes is out by half a step and, and Bruce Froman called him safe. <laughs> and they proceeded to, Gene Garber was pitching. He, Tried to pick Lopes off at first, threw the ball down the right field line. Lopes got the second. Next pitch, Bill Russell hit between his legs, and they beat a six to five. So, and it's a game that we should have won. And if they had replay like they do today, we would have won that game, and that would have changed the whole the whole way of the series. Uh, you know, especially when you're only playing five games, that would have given us a two games for one lead. Yeah, with Elton pitching the next night. So, you know, that that changes everything. So with that said, and I'll, I'll veer off a little bit again, comparing today's game to your era. I mean, do you think, so do you think replay is a good thing for situations like that? Or do you feel like human error is part of the game? Well, human error is part of the game as far as balls and strikes are concerned. I think that's going a little bit too far. But the object uh, is, you know, I, I like the way they're doing it now because they give you so many challenges. And, and that's it. And if you challenge and you, and you're correct, you get another one. And I like the way that's structured because the object's to get it right. You know, so teams aren't, aren't, you know, and there's still some, they still have problems with it. There's times where, you know, it's, it's obvious the guy's out, they call him safe and even yeah. the replay call him safe and they still, and you go, there's no way he's safe. 
you know. So there's there's got to be that physical element. I mean, us as players, we make mistakes. The umpires make mistakes. It's just that's human nature. So, you know, the as I said, very good teams in seventy eight or 77, seven, well, 76 before you got there even. Uh, the, right. They had won three straight division titles. 79 has struggled a little bit. I think Pete Rose came there in 79, but... Right. Good. Yeah, and I missed the majority of 79. I pitched 14, and I had a bad arm. I hurt my arm in that 78, 79 season. Yeah. And back in the middle of it. And the team struggled a little bit, but 1980, this the team finally gets over the hump. I mean, pretty much it's still the same core of players. Um, right, you guys get over the hump and beat the Royals in the World Series. What was the big difference in those in those teams and and not winning? Well, other than Bruce Froming, <laughs> right? Um, right. Not yeah, winning. I mean, we, we we had the pitching that matched up with Houston, you know, and, and to you know, Houston lost J.R. Richard in the middle of that season. Had he been healthy and yeah. pitched in that series, I think there would have been a different outcome because we were very lucky for the five games went extra innings. That was an amazing series, by the way. I, yeah. You know, I jumped right to the Royals, and I'd forgotten about what a great series that Houston uh, Philly series was in 1980. Every game right. was a nail biter. Right, right, right. Yeah. So I mean, they they were all exciting. Four out of the five went extra innings, so there was action. You know, every every you're on the edge of your chair, the edge of your seat for the entire the entire series. And then after winning that, it was like we finally could relax and just play in the World Series and, and made it so much easier. There was no pressure at all to, to win the World Series. We finally got to the World Series, and that's what we've been striving for. And now let's just go out and have fun playing baseball. And that's, I think that's what we did. I think we all felt a, a lot of pressure off our shoulders because of the failures in the past three out of the past four years of, of not being able to get to the World Series. And I was very fortunate. I played nine years, and I was in the playoffs five different times. So I was very fortunate. I played in very, very good teams. I was also on the 84 Cub team yeah. that lost. We had a two-game lead to San Diego and lost three in San Diego. But those Phillies teams, I mean, was there a big difference between, uh, you know, Danny Ozark? Uh, I, they're different people, obviously, Danny Ozark and Dallas Green, um, personality-wise, I would guess. But was it was, right. there, was there a lot of difference playing for both of them? Well, I, I think the difference was Danny kind of lost control of the team. Mm. You know, after a while, we we be, we kind of became complacent with winning, and uh, just had to go about just be, just go out there to win. And I think when Pete came over, that changed everything. That changed the uh, a lot of the dynamic of the team. When you see a guy like that that hustles and plays as hard as he plays, it kind of rubs off on everybody. I mean, even as a pitcher, it rubbed off on me to just to hustle, to, to do the best you could every time you went out there. I mean, it just, you know, you, you owe it to the fans to give it your best all and be prepare yourself on a daily basis to uh, be the best you can be mm -hmm. every night. You know, and that's, I think, a lot of that rubbed off when uh, Pete got there. He he really pushed people. You know, Larry Boa and he were very, very good friends. And Boa, he stirred the drink. He kept everybody going and kept everybody active. And then when Pete came over, he kind of had somebody uh, that he always looked up to. So the rest of us looked up to Pete. And, he, and, and when you're with Pete on a daily basis and see a man that plays that hard, you can't help but, you know, get excited to come to the ballpark and yeah. play and see what do i mean he's just he was amazing he was fun to play with i hated playing against him and i loved playing with him and he was the only guy i paid attention to that what i did off lifetime off he was two for 11 off me lifetime and i'm more proud of that than probably anything else i did in baseball well that's pretty good when you only get you know two out of uh you know 4500 hits or whatever he had uh the, the final number that's pretty good uh record right right what, what what was it like? So we talked about Lefty and, uh, and and now Pete Rose. I mean, as far as I mean, Steve Carlton had a tough reputation in the press. But I, I, I in fact, I just watched something on YouTube where, you know, his teammates seemed to to really like Steve Carlton and in his in his persona with the press. Um, I'm not sure where it came about, but he was a very misunderstood guy. Um, from what I could gather from this uh, little documentary I was watching on YouTube, what was your relationship personally with, with uh, lefty and even, and even Pete? Well, I had a good relationship. 
relationship with lefty being a pitcher you know you can always learn learn things from other pitchers i can remember vividly being in chicago and we had a reliever named kevin Saucier in, in chicago and wrigley the locker room very small so the pitchers would wait till the position players got dressed uh so they could go out for batting practice and then we got dressed kind of in shifts and uh kevin Saucier went up to lefty and said you know how do you hold your slider and lefty standard answer would you hold it like this and <laughs> throw the hoop out of it <laughs> and and uh about five minutes later lefty comes back and he starts now he starts discussing the slider and he talks about elbow you get your elbow higher you're going to get more downward break the flatter your elbow the flatter the break you know so i put that in my back pocket i put that in, you know there's something that i can really use so now the the, the uh count in the at bat determines what i'm going to do as far as the depth of my slider do i want it to go down more do i want it flat if i'm ahead oh two i want a flatter break that's going to run off the plate if i'm Two and zero. Oh, I've got to throw it on the plate for a strike, so I want more depth. I want it to go down more, so it changes plane, so it'll drop four to six inches as opposed to breaking four to six inches wider. So that was something that I always, you know, and the lefty was very, uh, you know, he had a lot to offer, you know, and, and but you had to ask him. He's not going to offer unless you came up and you know really specifically asked him questions. Uh, but he was fun to be around. He was great. You know, he was great to be around. I always enjoyed being around Lefty. He was always fun. He was a fun person to go out to dinner with and and do different things with. He was he was very very fun person. What, what uh, about, Pete, yeah, he yeah. was a little different. Uh, he the, the position players in Philadelphia kind of hung together, and the pitchers kind of hung together in Phil, in Philadelphia. It was a little different in Chicago with the Cubs. We all hung together as a team. What, with with Pete, did you um, in that time you were with him with the Phillies? I mean, did you have any inkling of the potential that could, you know, the the Pete Rose story and how it ended up? Did you see any inkling, uh, any early signs that Pete was going to run into trouble the way he did? Well, he he was a gambler, you know, and he was always, you know, and he would talk. He said, "I don't drink, but I sit up until three o'clock, three o'clock, four o'clock in the morning watching ESPN." You know, so yeah, he was a little different, and uh, but he would go to the dog track. He was horse track. He was he was always going somewhere to uh, bet on the horses or the dogs, wherever we were, whether we were in Florida or, or in Philadelphia. He had a driver, and he had somebody pick him up and, and take him uh, to various, uh, you know. And then the Atlantic City was there, the casinos there, you know. So. Yeah, there was there was some inclinations that you know he was a gambler, and that was you know it's it's something that you know it's not it's addictive like anything else. You know, and you, it, you start getting carried away with it. You know, it's it's very destructive. Can be. Do you have any opinion, uh, Warren, on the way Major League Baseball has dealt with Pete since uh, that incident, and and never? Really coming well, close to reinstating him? Well, not only Pete, I have a hard time with Pete being the all time hit leader, Barry Bonds being the all time home run leader, yeah. Roger Clemens winning side seven side young, and none of those three are in the Hall of Fame. You know, I mean what does that say about the game? <laughs> you know, you're you're in the Hall of Fame for you as a player, yeah. not as you know, and so you do and I and I think you know, a lot of the a lot of the Hall of Fame members are, you know, they are held in the high esteem and they don't believe those guys should be in there, you know, for Clemens and, and Bonds with the steroid issue. It's going to take a long time for them to be inducted into the Hall of Fame. If they ever, you see when you walk in the door of any clubhouse in professional baseball is, I, and I can't remember what number it is, but it's a gambling, yeah. you know, you can gamble period. Yeah. And it's, Huge and it's in big letters, and and you understand that from day one. You know, there's there's an integrity about the game, and the people, uh, you know, again, the Hall of Fame members are, you know, they're high, held in high esteem, and uh, the Bonds, the Clemens, the Roses have broken the trust of of that, you know, of the Hall of Fame. So you know, it's understanding 
how they don't get in, but I think in time they will. Eventually, the steroid era is going to pass, come to pass, and I think fetal gambling will come to pass in time. It's yeah. just sad it's not there now. I, I agree. I, I, I'm kind of of the inkling. Uh, my, my opinion is, and for whatever that's worth, um, is to put guys like that in, but, you know, and warts and all. I mean, on their plaque, suspended for gambling on baseball. Or, right. You know, caught up in the steroid scandals of the 2000s, whatever, or whatever the situation is. Put them in. They belong in there. Uh, right. And tell their story as it happens. Right. Right. So, sounds like you're right. kind of in the same place. Right. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So, again, great teams you played with in in, in Philadelphia. You end up in uh, in 80, uh, let's see, what was it, 82-ish, I guess, moving on to the White Sox, yeah. not playing a whole lot. What was it like? What What was your feeling leaving that Phillies team? Were you? Were you... Well, I, you know, it was time for me to move on. I was struggling in my career, and I needed to uh, hear maybe some new new uh, sound out mm-hmm. of pitching coach for teams and stuff. Uh, I went to the White Sox for the month of uh, September 1982. Yeah. And the main reason, uh, Jim Bunning was my agent. I had, I wanted him to move me because I had incentives in my contract. And I knew if I went back to Philadelphia for that September, I wasn't going to pitch. And if I didn't pitch in that month of September, I prepared myself uh, when I went back to the minor leagues to pitch again in the big leagues i went out and ran two miles every day i did not miss a day from the middle of june to the first of september uh preparing myself mentally to get back to the big leagues if i get another shot i'm going to be ready and take advantage of it uh and then going to and just getting a new uh change of scenery was uh very beneficial and playing for tony la was was exciting i enjoyed playing for tony uh, he was the guy that, you know, pulled me aside the first day I got there and said, we don't have any heroes here. We're in this, we're a team, you know, this is a team organization and we're going to win as a team, we lose as a team. And, you know, I really I enjoyed what he had to say and how he was going to go about managing. If you ever have any questions, my door is always open. Mm-hmm. You know, he was a real player's manager. And uh Doing that and then seeing the talent that they had there, oh, man, I couldn't believe they had some young arms, Rich Dodson, Britt Burns, uh, Dewey, Lamar Hoyt. Yeah. They had outstanding young arms. And you go, this team's going to win. Of course, they won the division in 83. Uh, but, you know, it, it came and went. But they, they were an outstanding organization. They were, they were really building, and they just couldn't sustain it. And then I was traded. Uh, in January of 83 to the Cubs. And now I'm back with Billy Connors, who was my pitching coach in AAA mm. uh, in the late 70s before I got called up to the big league. So I have somebody that's very familiar with my delivery. Uh, I struggled all through spring training that year. I struggled through the first so six weeks of the season. Uh, I finally said, Billy, I need to go down to the bullpen. I want you to watch me throw a little bit. And he immediately made an adjustment in my delivery. And I, and I proceeded to go from, I believe, May 25th to July 16th without giving up a run. I went 30 and some, 30 and a third innings, 30 and two thirds innings, 30 appearances without giving up a run. Um, got back to where I was able to sink the ball again. Uh, gave up one home run that season. So, you know, it's now I'm back. I finally figured out what it took for me to be successful. I learned to change up, so I added a pitch. So now I'm a three-pitch pitcher, and now I'm really having fun pitching because now I've got to change up to keep everybody off my fastball. I've, I've lost the velocity in my fastball, so now I've got to learn how to pitch. And I know the hitters, so I've got to, uh, you know, I already know the majority of them, so I've already got a plan on how I'm going to attack them, and now I've got to change up. So if anybody gets on my fastball, now the next pitch is going to be a changeup. So it, and I and I lost the velocity. I get two strikes on people. I couldn't put people away again with my sinker. Mm-hmm. So I started my changeup, and and they couldn't put it in play. So I used that as a strikeout pitch. I got two strikes on a hitter. I started throwing changeups. So I you know, I changed my whole velocity of pitching. Well, they had some nucleus, uh, a nucleus of a, of a good team. It wasn't a really good record in uh, '83, but in '84 that team comes together. Few new right. faces, 
a new manager and when you're in the playoffs again, um, right? What put what 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 changed for that team? I mean, obviously, you know, Rick Sutcliffe came in at uh, midseason. There was a managerial right. change. What was the big thing you think that that got that team from you know being twenty games under five hundred to winning the division the next year? Well, uh, the biggest thing was Dallas Green taking over as the general manager of the yeah, Cup. Good point. He he made he wheeled a deal. I mean, he got he traded. The, the big trade he made was Ivan De Jesus for Larry Boa, and and by the way, just throw in Ryan Sandberg. <laughs> throw in, right? <laughs> so, yeah, and and so that was a steal, you know. And Ryan Sandberg, obviously, you know, his career speaks for itself. And I played with Ryan in the minor leagues, and you knew what type of uh, player he was. He was, I mean, if there was anybody that played this game without effort, it was him. He just, it was amazing. To watch him in Chicago go from first to third on a base hit to the outfield. I mean, it's just amazing how he did everything so effortlessly. I went out and played golf with him one day, and for 18 holes, he made one bad shot. He was just a, just a phenomenal athlete. Again, an all-state basketball player, football player, baseball player in the state of Washington growing up. You know, just a, one of the best. He and Mike Schmidt were by far the best two athletes I ever played with. Would you rank one above the other? Because I was going to ask you if his Sandberg was the best. Yeah, I, I it, you know, they both they, they lack of effort, they, as effortless as they could possibly play. I mean, it just, yeah, you you would take six and half dozen of the other. Mm-hmm. You couldn't, you know, I, I could, to this day, I could never do, you know, he did maybe in a baseball sense, you'd have to give Schmidt the nod because he hit more home runs than Rhino did. But other than that, as far as players, you know, they each had their own thing. They are great defensive players. Anything hit to the right side uh, was an out. He covered so much ground at second base. It was just, it was unbelievable. You know, and I was very fortunate. You know, the biggest thing in my career to me was I didn't give up, but maybe three or four unearned, unearned runs my entire career. I, I was sitting one night and talking to my oldest son and saying, you know, I can't remember giving up too many unearned runs i looked on my baseball card i pitched four years in the big leagues before i gave up an unearned run that's how good our defense was that's pretty good defense mm-hmm. now that was a again another the playoffs that year against san diego you guys get up two games to nothing and and it looks like you're cruising to the cubs first world series and you know right what, however many Four. years it was at that point right um right I- about that was the, the 1945 Cubs played the Detroit Tigers, yeah. and Steve Trout's father, Dizzy Trout, pitched against the Cubs yeah. for Detroit at series. So now Steve's going to pitch against Detroit when we go to the World Series and play Detroit, <laughs> except we don't get there. I mean, that, that had to be a heartbreaking loss. I mean, you talked about '77 with the Dodgers and and right. how, how deflating right. was that? This, how does this compare? Is it is it worse? Yeah, I you know I, yeah I think it's it's sung a little worse yeah because that would with the Dodgers it would have been just a two game to one lead uh, having a two game to none lead and you know almost looking by going to San Diego and, and playing a three game series and even thinking about losing yeah. all three it, it never entered your mind and pretty soon uh, what they did was, was the biggest thing that San Diego beat us in that series was. The, was with their bullpen. Their starting pitchers didn't get through the third or fourth inning, I don't think, in any game. And their bullpen picked them up big time. They, they just Their bullpen was lights out in the entire series. We didn't touch them at all. And that that's what, especially when we played the three games in San Diego, and that's what turned the series around. You know, the, the we had one-to-one, I believe, game three in like the seventh inning, and Eckersley got hurt and gave up a run, and, and now they were going to, leave their pit they pinch hit for their pitcher and they went to the bullpen and it changed everything and then uh game four steve garvey hit an opposite field home run off lee smith to win that in the in extra inning yeah. so now but now we come sunday and sutcliffe is 16 and one and and already won game one of the playoffs so he's 17 and one for the season with us and we jump out to a nothing lead in the uh, second or third inning. We're up three nothing, and, and you're sitting there going, "Hey, we're going to the World Series." You know, Sutcliffe's going to shut them down, and, and uh, we're going to win this game. 
but, but the oddity of that day was uh, it was 90 degrees in San Diego that day. And Sutcliffe in about the sixth inning ran out of gas. It was yeah. just the heat up to him. And we've been playing in Chicago and uh, it's, haven't had any hot days in probably six weeks. And then, so the heat caught up with him. And uh, uh, the, the one thing, the biggest play of the game was the ball that went through Leon Durham's legs. That changed the whole the whole outcome of the game. It, it, that allowed them to tie the game. And then Tony Gwynn hit a bullet past Ryan Sandberg at second base to put them up. And then with Gossage in their bullpen, you know, it's pretty much over now. You know, any time Goose came into a ball game, regardless of where he pitched, whether it was Pittsburgh, Yankees, San Diego, wherever he was, uh, the game was over. He was uh, shut down. You know, you very seldom scored off Goose. You know, Leon Durham had a pretty good year for that team, uh, and that had to be just an awful moment for him. Um, how do you deal with that afterwards? Well, it was it was very difficult. You know, he, he you know, but that's the way he was. He was able to handle things, and us as as teammates, we all make mistakes, and yeah. that just you know it happened in a bad time. But but you've got to accept that as a teammate. We're human and, and we're going to make mistakes. All of us make mistakes and it just happened at a bad time. You know, it's just, you know, it's kind of the same thing that Buckner went through with, um, in Boston, except that was in a world series, you know, so it was a little more magnified. Yeah. Uh, but it's, you know, the same situation. And as a teammate, all you can do is control him and, and, you know, say, Hey, we, we wouldn't have gotten this far if it wasn't for you. You know, you're a part of this team and it just, it just, you know, it's just at a bad time. That's just the way it goes, and you accept that. Did he? Did he ever face any of the, uh, uh, you know, the negative uh, response from the fans in Chicago the way Buckner did in Boston? No, nothing. Nothing even close to it. You know, and then the, the amazing thing that we came back uh, that Sunday night, we came back from San Diego, and it was pouring down rain. And they brought us back to the international terminal or at the international and we loaded the buses up and it was about two o'clock in the morning. It's pouring down rain. And there was a woman standing outside the gate with a Cubs pennant, waving her pennant in the pouring down rain at two o'clock in the morning. It was, it was one of the saddest sights I've ever seen in my life. <laughs> that make you feel good a little, that'd make you feel good yeah. a little bit though, I guess. Right. Right, yeah. I mean, but that's Chicago. I mean, that's that's the type of people that you know. That's Cub fans. They they loved you. They, you know, we're always the lovable losers. Yeah. You know. You, and, you, um, you know, it, it's funny. The, the Red Sox had kind of the same same um, you know history as the Cubs in a lot of ways. And there's a lot of I talked to a lot of Red Sox fans, and I wonder if you feel it's a witch this way with the Cubs now that they've won. After they finally broke their curse and won, they felt like they would lost something. By actually right. winning, you think right. you're that in Chicago? Yes, yeah. yeah, yeah. I believe, yeah, yeah, because they've had a hard time. That nucleus has, has stayed together, but they've had a hard time uh, getting anywhere in the playoffs yeah. since 2016. Yeah, it's, you know, and I think this might be their last year of, of keeping that nucleus together. A lot of them, Chris Bryant's a free agent. I think Rizzo might be a free agent. Some of their key players, uh, Baez, they're they're all going to be free agents at the end of the year. Uh, but they're off to a good start. And I, you know, I told people that you know my prediction was they they're not going to go very far because they didn't think they had the pitching. But they had they stayed at the top of the division the whole season so far. So you know, and if they can pick up a player or two, a pitcher or two at the break or at the at the trading deadline, you never know what they can do. Yeah. You know, because they're it's it's a offensive ballpark, and they they they've got some offensive players. If they do. It's a funny game. That's why we have to play the games because you play them on paper. It would be no fun, right? So yeah, right, right. Because you look at them on paper and say, "There's I don't see how they can compete with the Cardinals and Milwaukee," but they, they're doing it. Yeah. Let me, uh, Warren. Before I, we talk a little bit about uh, what you're doing today, I want to circle back. Um, because when we were talking about the Phillies and some of your teammates, I wanted to talk about uh, Tug McGraw, who was quite a quite a, a character, obviously a great right. pitch, great pitcher, great relief pitcher. And I know your wife is the head of the Tug McGraw Foundation now. But let's talk to me a little bit about uh, your relationship with Tug and and how your wife uh, 
came about to be the uh, CEO and and um, I guess was it president and CEO? I'm not. I think I'm yeah, not. she's the yeah. president and CEO of the Tug McGraw Foundation. Yeah. Right. Talk to me a little well, bit about Tug. The biggest thing is well, Tug and I grew up. He grew up in Vallejo, and I grew up in Napa. Vallejo and Napa are about twenty miles apart. So. He had some mutual friends that he went to high school with because in those days, Napa didn't have a Catholic high school. And Tug went to the Catholic high school there in Vallejo. Mm -hmm. So kids from Napa that went to Catholic school or the Catholic high school had to drive from Napa down to Vallejo. Well, I had some friends that I played baseball with as little kids. Their sister was uh, one of Tug's classmates. So, you know, we, so we had some mutual friends just to, to start with, you know, and when I got to the big leagues, I got to the big leagues, uh, when Tug hurt his elbow in right. April of, of 1977. So immediately, you know, I said, I'm from Napa, you know, so, and he goes, my brother lives in Napa. His cousin, he's got two cousins that live here in Napa. In fact, one lives, uh, six doors up the road from me. So it was, I mean, it was always kind of a family deal once. We got to know each other. Uh, it was always like a family type thing. Every time he would come to the Napa or to California, he would stop in and say hi, and, and we'd all get together and have uh, uh, family dinner together and stuff like that. So our relationship grew uh, even more after uh, we both retired. So now uh, he came back as a guest instructor in the uh, spring of 2003. and. Uh, he was doing fine. Everything was going good. He was he would spend the early morning with the big club, and then he would come down to the minor leagues where I was coaching, and work with a couple of minor league pitchers, some of the uh, left-handed pitchers. They gave him three or four kids to work with. Uh, so he came down in the afternoons with us, and then all of a sudden, uh, he started having problems. He he was getting up uh, in the morning on days off. They had a day off. And he got up and went to the ballpark. He started becoming disoriented. Mm. And then all of a sudden collapsed. And they took him to Morton Plant Hospital in Clearwater. And they determined that he had a brain tumor. And that they, he was needed to be operated on uh, ASAP. So it just so happened that Tim McGraw's son and Faith Hill were performing in Orlando. So they were in the area. So my wife immediately flew. She came in, and she and Faith started putting together, putting their heads together on what are we going to do? What is, what's their plan of action? What's the course of action? What are we going to do? So they looked it up, and there are four places that do brain tumor uh, operations on brain tumors. MD Anderson in Houston, UCSF in San Francisco, Duke University, and uh, University of South Florida and Tampa. So they said, well, we can just take him across the causeway. So they took him across the causeway. They consulted with the doctor. We all sat in there with 10 or 12 of us sat in and what they're going to do. And, uh, so on St. Patrick's Day, all days, uh, he has, uh, brain surgery. So he goes through that. And, uh, my youngest son, who's autistic, he sees Tug, and Tug's got big staples in his head. His head's shaved, but he's got a big U in his head. And my youngest son looks at Tug and starts calling him baseball head because it looks as his, 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 the seams on his head look like a baseball. You know, so it broke up everybody, broke the tension in the room immediately. Yeah. And it was so, it's just, my youngest son is, is quite a comedian. <laughs> anyway. <laughs> Now what are they going to do? What's what's the you know? Now he's been operated on. What's going to happen? So uh, he couldn't travel. So his brother Hank and he rented a uh, condominium in Tampa so he could convalesce. And I was coaching in Clearwater at the time, and I had Sundays off, so I would go Saturday night. I would pack a bag and go over and spend the weekend with them, and come back early Monday morning back to uh, Clearwater for. Um, baseball um, instruction or um, uh, uh, spring training uh, spring training type uh, action that we did in 
uh, for the Phillies. So we'd go out, Hank and I'd go out and play golf, and then Tug, we'd get on the green and Tug would putt. We'd try to keep him active. We'd go out to dinner. We'd do different things to try to keep him going. So finally, at the end of the spring, right somewhere in the uh, middle of June, he was able to, to uh, travel. So Tim sent one of his buses down. So they loaded everything up, Hank, Tug, my youngest son, Jack, and Jennifer, my wife. They, uh, four of them loaded up the bus and they drove up to media where he'd lived before in, uh, outside of Philadelphia and they found a house. Jennifer found a house for him to live in. So she took care of, she was his caregiver the rest of his life. So mm. she would come. Uh, by that time, by the middle of June, uh, Jack had to go back to school or no, by the, by the first of September, I was home from coaching. So Jack had to go back to school. So I took care of Jack and she stayed with Thug. And um, then the, the telltale sign was uh, Jack loves Halloween. That's his favorite, one of his favorite times of year. And I said, you know, I said, you got to come home for Halloween. You know how Jack loves Halloween. So she said, okay, I'll be home. So she took Tug in to the doctor and they had to um, give him a brain scan to see how the tumor was doing. And she said, uh, you know, bad news. It's continuing to grow. They can't, they can't uh, stop it. It's you know, so it's just a matter of time. And uh, then he passed away. He wanted to pass away at Tim's farm in Nashville. So we all met in Nashville uh, that end of December, and uh, he passed away, I believe, about the fifth or sixth of January. Certainly a sad uh, story. Died way too young, and right. such, such a right. great, vibrant person you know uh yeah, yeah. From, from very vibrant the outside just a great man to be around just yeah man's man just just a wonderful individual so in, in during that time my wife and he set up uh, the foundation to uh you know along with tim and faith uh they set up a foundation to uh help the betterment of people with brain tumors bioblastoma well, they're doing some great work there, and I'll I'll, I'll certainly uh, put up a link to the website and such on on my page uh, along with this interview too. So, uh, thank you, Keith. I appreciate it. Yeah, absolutely. We want to we want to uh, help people who are helping other people more than uh, anything else, for sure. Right. Uh, real right. quick before we wrap up here, Warren, you're now the pitching coach, as we mentioned earlier, uh, for the uh, Napa Valley Community College. Um, right. Have you enjoyed it? You've been doing it for quite some time. I think you told me 20 years. Um, yeah, yeah. On and off over there for over 20 years. Yeah. Did you have any aspirations <laughs> of, of doing, you know, major league uh, a pitching coach or, or anything in that regard? Or did you just want to get back and, and help younger? I, I coached Philly, Philly organization for six years from 1999 to 2004. And I enjoyed it. It was a lot of fun, but it was very difficult on my family life. Mm -hmm. I was on the coast for six months and home for six months. So, uh, and they let me go. And so I didn't want to pursue it anymore. I was happy. My, my older son was a freshman in college. I'd missed all his high school playing. I'd missed a lot of his development. So I could go out and help other kids develop. And, you know, so, so for me, I looked at it and said, you know, it's time to be home. So, and then with Jennifer taking over the, the Tug McGraw Foundation and traveling a lot, somebody had to stay home with Jack because he's special needs. Mm -hmm. so, so, you know, it was, it was way easier for me to stay home than it was for her. So I kind of took over, you know, playing Mr. Mom and uh, kind of did that. And then I was able to coach my oldest son. I had one season his sophomore year in college. I got to coach him. Oh, that must so be that, fun. Yeah. yeah, it was. It was fun for the both of us. You know? And we still talk about that to this day. That was uh, in 2007, uh, 14 years ago. So we, you know, we had a great time together. It was a lot of fun. Uh, so, you know, it's, I've enjoyed coaching at the junior college. You know, the biggest thing is, and, and the way we go about it is we're a two-year school. We're a feeder school for four-year schools. Uh, we don't care if we win or lose. What we're trying to do is develop you, not only in the classroom, but on the baseball field. And if you love baseball, 
come and play for us for two years and we will send you on to a four-year school with the objective is to get a four-year degree. And that's something baseball is not going to last forever. That four-year degree is going to something you will have for a lifetime and that will benefit you immensely throughout your life. Yeah. good. There's a lot of kids. I mean, that's the reason I did it. When I was 19 and I'd gotten drafted by the Giants and, and now what? You know, I didn't know what to do. And and so I know uh, kids at that age, they, they're at a crossroads. What do I do? You know, do I want to pursue school? Do I want to continue to play baseball? So there's a lot of a lot of doubt in a lot of these kids' minds. And if me as an ex-major leaguer can lead the kids uh, to – Getting a four-year education, you know, do the work in the classroom. That's something that you'll always have the rest of your life, you know. So I, I very, I really put a lot of emphasis on that. Very important to me. Well, that's awesome, and it's great work you're doing. As you said, a lot of these kids get wrapped up in the dream, right, and forget about right. the odds are against most of them, or the great right. majority uh, of them. I have had one kid make it to the big leagues that I have coached. In 2009, we had a player named Tyler Cravey. Tyler got to the big leagues with Milwaukee uh, parts of, I think, 13 and 14, 15. He, he spent parts of three seasons up up and down with Milwaukee. Good. Well, Yeah, so I've been very fortunate. We, we sent a few kids on to Division One, Not too many because we're a kind of a lower division program. We don't get a lot of talent here unless we go out and recruit it, which the last five years they've allowed us to recruit, so it's changed our program a lot. Well, you're doing some good work there, and I, I, I wish you continued luck and – and your wife's doing great work, uh, you know, with the foundation. Obviously, um, you've had leads, and you had a great career. I, I tell, I tell a lot of the guys that I've had on. I've had a lot of guys on from your era, Warren, and people love to to hear from you guys. And you know, the lefties, they're all great players, right? The Steve Carlton, right. the, the Mike Schmitz. Yeah. But I always tell my audience when I have you guys on that baseball, there wouldn't still wouldn't be baseball without the Warren Brewsters and. The Greg, the Greg Priors and, and the guys that I've had on that are, you know, right. they're not as well known, but you're important parts right. of really good teams. Yeah, yeah. You know, I was very fortunate on the teams I played on, you know. And Greg Priors, an old teammate of mine from Venezuela. We played in 1977 in Maracaibo. No kidding. Yeah, yeah. There's there's connections. Baseball, it's just it's unbelievable how, it, how they connect. It's ever it's, it's funny. It seems like everybody I talk to has a connection with everybody else I've ever talked to. It's it's it's, right, it's amazing. Right. Yeah, along the line, yeah, you, yeah. You connect one way or the other, somewhere along the line, it's it's amazing. It's it's such a fraternity. It's it's just it's you know, a lot of people don't get a chance to do it, and the, the few that are very fortunate, like myself, that were able to do it, are just you know you thank your lucky stars. You know, yeah. I was very, you know took a lot of hard work. I didn't look at it as work. I enjoyed doing it. I enjoyed the, the challenge. Well, you should be very proud of your career and very proud of what you're doing now. Warren, I appreciate you coming, coming on today. Um, it's been a great uh, conversation with you. I wish we'd go a bit, little bit longer. If you want to stay on the phone real quick, I'm going to uh, just uh, click off this uh, broadcast, and uh, I'll be back to finish up the uh, show. Thank okay. you. Thanks, for having, Thanks for having me. I enjoyed it. I enjoyed talking to you. Thank you very much. Thanks, Warren. So, Warren Brewster, guys, plethora, my favorite word, of technical difficulties this morning. I really apologize. Uh, gosh, we had the problem with Warren's phone last night, and then we had a little problem with the audio this morning. So, hopefully, hopefully the experience wasn't too bad. I know some of you had jumped on a little bit later, so that's probably a good thing. And... Um, Listen, we, th we thank you for, for sticking through it. Carlos, some great comments there uh, about the Pete Rose stuff. And, and uh, thank you, Dave Gayette, for pointing out the uh, audio issues. I wish I'd caught it sooner. I apologize. It's always, uh, it's always uh, uh, problematic when I, uh, when I record stuff. Sometimes I need to do click a certain uh, box, and sometimes I don't. So anyway, guys, I appreciate you for sticking it out with me. I thank Warren Brewster doing some great stuff out there at Napa Valley. His wife's doing some great stuff with the Tug McGraw Foundation. And guys like Warren Brewster, as I said, made have made Major League Baseball go for a long time. The stars are important, but the guys, uh, you know, the, 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 the lifers, the, 
the the grinders like Warren Brewster are what I really enjoy digging into uh, when it comes to uh, Major League Baseball. So thank you, Warren. Uh, thank you all for watching. Next week, guys, uh, well, Sunday we'll have our Stream of Consciousness show. I'll have Jim Beringer from The Last Word on Hockey on to talk about the uh, the Canadians getting to the cup final for the first time uh, since 1993. We've got game seven tonight of the Islanders and the uh, Lightning. We'll be talking about all of that. Uh, we'll, we'll talk about the Major League Baseball news, some NFL news, and some other stuff. And I'll be on uh, the Mac and Jack show here in just a few minutes as well. And uh, next week, uh, with the holiday week, we're in flux a little bit. I'll let you guys know early in the week what we're going to be doing as far as Friday and Sunday shows. So, guys, great, great job. Out of kidding. <laughs> Carlos, you're killing me. Uh, we'll pick that up Sunday, Carlos, uh, with Jim Baring here. Guys, that a great Friday. Been a great interview. Apologize for technical difficulties. Thanks for being with me. Keith Engel, TGI Sports Talk on the Northeast Stream Sports Network. You guys make us go. Thank you so much. Have a great weekend.